has played a powerful part in the life of the people of Liberia and has been interwoven with large musical performance fabric. This proved to be true particularly during the Civil War period from 1989 to 2003. And during the more recent Ebola epidemic, 2014 to 2016, when war or th illness threatened during these periods of crisis, believers and members of various faith traditions in Liberia turned to powerful performances of singing, dancing, and instrumental playing to bring strength, hope, and healing. All of this might be a bit surprising to missionaries from the middle of the 20th century who came from North America to devote their lives to converting the Liberians to become Lutherans, Methodists, Baptists, Roman Catholics, AME, and various Pentecostal groups. Many of them became discouraged at what they considered to be low number of conversions and Christians who simultaneously maintained their indigenous practices. But if one looks to Liberia today, Christian churches are flourishing, though there may be practices and styles that would surprise their missionary founders. For there have been a great deal of interchange of musical practices. For example, with African-American religious traditions in all the churches today. Spirituals, gospel music are as likely to be performed as American European hymns. Local instruments like drums and gourd rattles, as well as Western drum sets, electronic keyboards, and electronic amplifiers form the tools of musicians across Liberia. The pump organ that missionaries used in their services in the early 20th century has been supplanted by electronic organs and keyboards. English language performance co coexists alongside indigenous choirs. Reports indicate that this Christian performance takes place within a total population in Liberia of 3.5 million people, of whom nearly 3 million identify as Christian and 500,000 identify as Muslim. My goal here is to analyze some intensive ethnographic work that I first conducted in Liberia with church choirs, beginning in the late 1980s and extending to 2016. The case studies that I draw from are anchored in choirs that performed in the Kwela language and that are affiliated with the Lutheran Church in Monrovia, the capital, and in Bong County, about 90 miles interior. The choir with whom I worked most intently has been the St. Peter's Luther Bella Choir in Sinkor, a suburb of Monrovia. My ethnographic method anchors itself in the phenomenological approach of Alfred Schutz, which emphasizes the importance of understanding the perspectives of the people who perform or who are part of the audience as they create meanings in the course of so social interaction that is Christian worship. The fieldwork practices from this perspective involved attending religious events and practices during which I often video and audio recorded the music making. On occasion, I played back these recordings to the performers and congregation members for their response in what I term playback interviews. These playback interviews were also recorded and transcribed for analysis and study. The musicians and congregation assisted at every turn in discerning the important and critical meanings. Now, Roberta has already alluded to the fact that I went to Liberia first when I was three years old, and I think I should just share a bit of my background so that you understand where I'm coming from in making some of my conclusions. I was daughter, as she said, of Lutheran missionaries, and my father was in charge of the Kwela language training for the missionaries and of the work of translating the New Testament into Kwela. I was sent back to the United States to attend high school and college because I was fairly unsocialized in American culture at that point. Because I had been homeschooled until high school, and I spent much of my young days going out to the rice fields or fishing with the women and playing with the local children 
and learning the local language without even realizing I had done so. So fast forward to the research, the Liberian Civil War. In the late 1988, I studied Kmele music as a Fulbright scholar in the urban and rural areas, as I told you. And at that point, Liberia was on the edge, as Samuel Doe, the dictator, was increasingly imprisoning those he considered his enemies. He was abolishing the freedoms that people had been accustomed to enjoy under the presidencies of William V.S. Tubman, the longest serving president, and William R. Talbert until he was beheaded in the coup in 1980. The choir members from St. Peter's, who you see up here, often came to my apartment that year and shared in whispers their worries about their jailed families. One evening, I attended the wake of James Y. Barbia from St. Peter's Lutheran, and the service opened as the congregation vigorously sang, God moves in a mysterious way his wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Multiple verses ensued, but the last two were intriguing to consider. His purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter, and he will make it plain. That was a critical line for the Liberians. This hymn, with words by William Cowper, 1774, had clearly been transmitted to the congregation via American missionaries who had come to convert them. The troon drew on Western hymnody, even as the timbre of singing was hard-edged and driving in the aesthetically desirable style of Liberian Christian singing. But my curiosity was piqued as to why this particular hymn opened the wake for a prominent Liberian, whom I had known for many years, though he had resigned from Doe's government and had actually lived in exile in Charlotte, North Carolina, until his death. In the course of my research, it became abundantly clear that Christian hymns formed part of the emotional glue that held people together during the war and people chose certain songs to express their deeply felt anger and fear, and they sang them fervently in the churches, particularly at wakes and funerals. So church and state issues became inseparably intertwined as people expressed political views in the context of religious worship. Now, switch to Ebola. Some 10 years following the Civil War's end, the horrific Ebola epidemic broke out in Liberia. When I returned in 2016 to study how music had been involved in the fight against this incredibly contagious disease, I went back to St. Peter's Lutheran Church. The Quella Choir reported that music was what kept them together at a time when they were forbidden from touching one another. Sound transcended space and linked them in community in critical ways. So whether it was war and the killing with guns or death by epidemic, the people of Liberia have turned in crisis over the years to music as a key part of their coping and recovery process. Though the Civil War and the Ebola epidemic have had somewhat different contours, they nevertheless display some important common themes. And it is those themes that I would like to tease apart in more detail in the discussion that follows. So let's switch back to the war. Singing the unspeakable. Shortly after I left Liberia in July 1989, following my extensive study of the Barbia funeral and its complexities, war broke out. For the next 14 years, civil war ensued and ebbed in what sometimes has been referred to as a series of wars. Ultimately, several hundred thousand people lost their lives, and it is estimated that nearly a million other Liberians were displaced from their homes to other places in Liberia, neighboring countries like Cote d'Ivoire and Ghana, or more distant new settlements in the United States and Europe. During the Liberian Civil War, Christian hymns sung in St. Peter's often continued to serve as anthems 
to express hidden meanings. Such hidden meanings are reminiscent of spirituals during the period of slavery in the U.S. when a text might speak of moving toward heaven, but also imply that the slaves were heading north to freedom. But I also discovered another kind of transformative use of religious music. During James Y. Barbia's funeral, the day after the wake where they sang God Moves in a Mysterious Way, the Puebla Choir sang a song drawing on indigenous sound structures, indigenous tunes, the Puebla language, and other images. Fama Nenikule, the vocal soloist, composed as she led the choir. In it, she sang that Jesus is the big, big zo or the big ritual priest. She also sang that Do will go, that is the dictator. This was astonishing. During a time when Monrovia was like a tinderbox in a pre-conflict mode, an ordinary Bella market woman was calling for the removal of the dictator. And she was citing Jesus as the ultimately powerful ritual priest who would presumably prevail to make it happen. As the musicians and others explained when I questioned them later, Fama had the right to sing what no one could openly speak on the streets of the capital city without getting arrested. This right was understood in Quela society and throughout Liberia. And for Fama, moving back and forth between the supernatural indigenous religious figures like the Zo and Christian religious personages like Jesus, this was both natural and powerful in getting her message across. So Fema could communicate what even Bishop Diggs, Ronald Diggs, who preached the funeral sermon, could not voice directly. While Diggs could speak of the need for people to come together, he never approached calling for the outright removal of Samuel Doe, nor did he assert his belief that Doe would eventually go. The medium of music and singing afforded Fama and the women of the Quella Choir that power and the chorus responded, Do Elie, Do must go, over and over again. St. <laughs> Peter's Lutheran Choir operated also within a larger context that's important to understand. For toward the end of the war, there seemed to be no way to bring peace. Summit after summit was held, um, after which the fighting among the various factions would break out again. Finally, a gathering was called in Ghana, but Charles Taylor, the current tyrant in charge, refused to attend. A mass movement of several thousand Christian and Muslim women came together and demanded peace. Dressed in white, they started at a large market in the city and moved to the main highway where all who traveled through the city would see them. They prayed, danced, and sang, demanding that the war must cease. And they did this daily until Charles Taylor relented and attended the talks where a fragile peace was reached. What was significant was the women were not just Christian women, but they were, and there were plenty of them, but the Muslim women joined the Christian women in a formidable show of strength as they moved together in sound, singing, and sometimes in silence. They included Lema Boe, who you may have heard about, who later won the Nobel Peace Prize for her actions as one of the leaders. All of this has been documented in the powerful film, Pray the Devil Back to Hell, and I'd like to play just a segment of this so you get a sense of what happened. Money. Greed, ethnicity, absolute power. There is nothing that should make people do what they did to the children of like me. The warlords would give these boys guns and send them off. They just do anything because they had guns. Go to bed saying, God, please. What do we do? The women of Liberia want peace now. I had a dream. And it was like a crazy dream. 
we decided to protest. We wore your white, saying to people we were out for peace. Thousands of women, Muslim and Christian, were coming together from different walks of life. These women had seen the worst, but they still had that vibrance for life. And we said, well, if I should get killed, just remember me that I was fighting for peace. We stepped out first and did the unimaginable. To send up a signal to the world that we, the Liberian women, we are tired of the killing of our people. We can do it again if we want to. The mention of cooperation of women from many faith traditions is significant here. For not only did these ordinary women come from multiple faiths, but they hailed from various ethnic groups. And this reach across the divide of belief and background paralleled another aspect of the Civil War. From the beginning of the war, as Bishop Diggs told me in an interview, the Liberian Council of Churches, which included Muslim and Christian alike, worked together to keep the war from spinning out into a religious war. These leaders connected on a ver variety of levels to keep communication open and to prevent fracturing along the lines of religious belief. All of this prevailed in a climate where a number of religious leaders, including Bishop Diggs, were jailed for periods of time for standing up and speaking the truth to the Liberian political leadership. For during the Civil War, church leaders very much saw it as their responsibility to stand up for what they thought was right and to express those views to politicians at all levels. Music proved to be a powerful medium during the Liberian Civil War to sustain communities and to move leaders to action. When I returned to work with the St. Peter's Choir in 2007, they recounted the ways in which singing had carried them and how it continued to buoy them up as they attempted to reconstruct their lives with family and friends scattered around the globe. Though peace was important to the recovery, it was by no means a total remedy for what they had suffered. But as they showed me, they were meeting to rehearse and sing and to connect with one another as they attempted to move forward in a new kind of normal. A mere 10 years after the beginning of the Civil War, toward the end of 2014, the Ebola epidemic struck in Liberia, as well as the neighboring Guinea and Sierra Leone. In the course of the rampage, Ebola infected nearly 11,000 people, and some 5,000 people died in the region. When I arrived to study the role of music in 2016, it was sputtering out. As I detail elsewhere, music and sound, including Christian music making, served above all to strengthen and sustain communities during a very frightening period. While this epidemic was not war, it was a crisis of another sort that threatened people in equally troubling ways. One of the major prohibitions was against touching people, friends and loved ones alike, because they could transmit the disease. Pastor Louis Baquet of St. Peter's Lutheran told me how human touch was a key part of his ministry. He could not shake hands or snap fingers in the customary greeting as parishioners left the church at the end of the service. Yet music and sound proved to be safe vehicles for binding congregants together. While touch could be contagious, sound was not. The church held services throughout the epidemic, even though people sat at some greater distance from one another, and the pastor handed the communion wafers to worshipers with a tweezers. Pastor McKay spoke about the power of music to heal and unite people, 
as he said of the music of that time, when they sang those songs, you know they just calmed you down. And sometimes you didn't even want to preach. You just felt that should be the sermon for the day. There were both hymns that were targeted for this crisis, as well as religious songs that were newly composed. In the case of hymns, one of the focal texts proved to be, It is well with my soul, with a text dating from 1873 by Horatio G. Spafford and a tune by Philip P. Bliss. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Much like God moves in a mysterious way resonated in a special way for Liberians during the war, it is well with my soul found special favor during the Ebola epidemic. During Ebola, the St. Peter's Lutheran Quella Choir actively composed songs to address this. Singers told me that their most powerful song was Ebola Elie, Ebola Must Go, and the chorus sang that phrase again and again in an ostinato to the varied solo phrases that the soloist intoned. I was struck by the parallel that this phrasing had to the song Do Must Go. In both cases, 20-some years apart, the women's choir had confronted powerful and formidable foes, and they substituted Ebola for Doe to express their unshakable belief. And it was as though they were not only sustaining themselves by singing, but they were expressing their clear and unshakable belief that this end would be accomplished. <laughs> The nurses, doctors, and health care aides also frequently drew on music to prepare for their grueling shifts, working in the Ebola isolation units with highly contagious patients. They frequently sang hymns and danced together in preparation as they bonded and buoyed their spirits before they dressed in the protective suits in which they had to work in the oppressive heat and humidity. They found this both natural and comforting to approach their work in this way. Religious songs that bind people together flourish during Ebola in a larger context of popular music that warned and educated people about the disease. Julie Endy, well-known popular musician, led her group to admonish people to use the pom in using the palm wine style that appealed to the older people. She has a song called Ebola is Real. Ebola is real. Let's protect ourselves and our family. Ebola can kill. It has no cure, but it can be prevented. Ebola, Ebola, let's fight it together. Let's fight it together. Let's protect our family and our nation. My people, Ebola is in Liberia. Ebola is real. Ebola can kill. Let us protect ourselves. Ebola is real. Let's protect ourselves and our family. Ebola can kill. It has no kill, but it can be prevented. Ebola, Ebola, let's fight together. Nation. Oh, always wash your hands with soap. 
such people with the signs of Ebola. The signs of Ebola, the headache, the pain, the diarrhea, the rash, the vomiting, and a red eye. Don't even touch their vomit, their pee-pee, their poo-poo, and their... While music had long been customary as part of death and funerals in Liberia, it proved eerily absent during the Ebola crisis. In a country where death rituals had been one of the most elaborate of the various life cycle rituals, burial teams were instructed to keep everyone far away from their work of loading the dead into pickup trucks and transporting them for burial in mass graves or for cremation. No rituals, with few exceptions, were observed and by the end of the epidemic, people were still pained by the abrupt way in which they had been torn from family and friends who died during the epidemic. And the burial teams themselves were shunned and discriminated against. There were few communities where family, after the fact, held memorials that featured singing and performance to redress this loss that occurred during the epidemic. And it formed the topic of a policy brief that I prepared during the epidemic in hope that in future epidemics, they would allow musicians and religious practitioners as part of the burial team. Just as Christians and Muslims came together at various points during the Civil War, whether it was with the clergy of the Liberian Council of Churches who stood up to the highest political leaders, or with the women who banded together at the end of the war to demand peace, so too cooperation ensued at a critical point during the Ebola crisis. As Mosoka Fala, a Liberian epidemiologist recounted, health workers had noticed a particularly high number of Ebola cases reported for the Caldwell region in Monrovia, where there were a high proportion of Muslims living. When they investigated further, they learned that contrary to all precautions, uh, that were being issued, people that people not touch patients or deceased, the Muslim community continued to care for the dead in the customary manner, carefully washing the bodies as they prepared for burial. Once the workers from the health ministry learned of this, Musoka led a group to meet with a prominent imam, Muslim leader, and explain the situation. Furthermore, Musoka offered to train the Muslims to be part of burial teams so that they could handle the bodies for burial, but do so with protective uh, gear and proper suits that would prevent the transmission of the disease. The imam agreed to the plan and admonished the community during his sermon on Friday, and the cooperation ensued with the health workers. Very shortly, the Ebola numbers dropped dramatically, and the Muslims cooperated with the wider community to prevent Ebola casualties. When they could, uh, could continue, uh, the Muslims with their suits to handle the casualties, they were willing to work with the larger community. A number of themes can be discerned about how Christian musical expression has been central in Liberian lives. First, Sounds, whether musical or not, are particularly noticed and attended to in times of crisis. During Ebola, for example, people noticed the sounds of sirens and ambulances and burial teams as they crisscrossed the capital city. Over time, they began to react viscerally and negatively to hearing the sound, for they knew it likely signaled another Ebola case and perhaps another death or more in the uncontrolled spread of disease. In fact, the response of the local communities to this siren sound became so pronounced that as the Ebola epidemic was winding down, Mosoka worked with the Ministry of Health to ask the teams to go into the neighborhoods and respond silently without their sirens. They didn't want people to become any more agitated than they already were. And by the time I arrived in 2016, they were much better able to respond to and control the outbreak. When people reacted negatively to sound, they were hearing on a siren. On occasions, they responded negatively to the absence of sound. When they couldn't bury their bodies of their family with music, this also created crisis. All of this is not particularly 
surprising when we consider that Gbele people, for example, emphasize and notice sounds. They possess an elaborate vocabulary for timbre and tone color. Two, religious music performance has knit communities together in times of war as well as epidemic. Locally composed religious songs and imported hymns alike were recontextualized and repurposed in both the Civil War and the Ebola epidemic as they sang these various songs that I recounted, God moves in a mysterious way and it is well with my soul. Whether they were communicating coded meaning about a dictator or girding themselves up to do battle with a epidemic, music was an emotional glue for these complex expressions of the spiritual and political. Three, the texts from one time of crisis transform subtly to become the words to express deeply held feelings for the next crisis. The most obvious of these, which I already mentioned, is that the do elie was morphed into ibola elie. The target of the singer's fervor in the first case was the dictator Samuel Doe, and in the second case, the dreaded disease. These texts shared a great deal in common and were adapted to fit the occasion. Four, while Muslim and Christian observances are distinct in their shape and context, communities have nevertheless been in broad-based dialogue spearheaded by faith leaders. During the war, as I mentioned, the Liberian Conference of Churches very deliberately included Muslim religious leaders in their interactions with government leaders. Though this did not prevent all of the possible acts of violence between the communities, it did keep the Civil War from becoming a religious war. At the end of the Civil War, the Christian and Muslim women united to protest the war they perceived that the military factions were unwilling to end. And during the Ebola epidemic, health authorities worked directly with local imams to convince them about the nature of Ebola and let trained Muslim burial teams take care of the bodies to drastically cut the rate and spread of disease. Five, movement of music and sound during the Civil War and even more dramatically during the Ebola epidemic has been uh, accelerated dramatically with the internet. During my research on the Ebola epidemic, musicians that I interviewed would inevitably refer me to Facebook. Check out my Ebola song on Facebook, they would say. Even though the musician might not have a computer, personal computer, she or he would have found a way to post the performances to a place where the world could access it. And that access increased linkages that they developed with their relatives and friends wherever they were in the diaspora. In order to better understand these themes, it's appropriate to frame all of them with some wisdom that a well-known blacksmith and ritual practitioner shared with me many years ago during my doctoral dissertation fieldwork. Gavolibula, as I've recounted elsewhere, put it this way. What I know about song, it came from sorrow. Even if you cry and do everything, except you must perform. The man is playing. The inside of his heart has cooled. If your heart hurts, you can't sit quietly once again. But before you sit quietly, you must sing. As Gawali Woolis saw it, music performance, including sound and movement, provided an essential way to return from pain or sorrow, whether it was caused by death and destruction in war or loss by family and friends. He spoke many years before either the Civil War or the Ebola outbreak, but his philosophy applied nonetheless. People and communities became agitated and unsettled by grief. Music provided a way for their troubled body and soul to return to a place of metaphoric quiet. And I'd like to just end with a little performance recorded after the war in a village that I returned to.
This is just entertainment music. Thank you. <laughs>